Today we're going to be talking about data tables, which is a follow-on from panel grids. And we'll also take a look at converters, and I'll throw into the mix uh, something about guiding user choice with some lists. Concepts you'll need from previous learning blocks include, uh, as well as the life cycle, of course, will be some uh, SQL and JDBC from learning block two, and from learning block three, the idea of panel grids. Remember, that allows us to take an object and to display its contents, making use of a table. But it's a fixed size in terms of both columns and rows. What we'll look at a little bit later on with data tables will allow us to display collections of objects. Now, the idea of the data table is that it will still have a fixed number of columns, but it will have one row per object in the collection. So it's a variable sized table. Both panel grid that we've seen already and data table that we're introducing now are in the HTML library in this namespace. We'll need two elements from that library, the data table element and also the column element. With the data table element, we introduce a new table. This will be rendered as an HTML table element and all the nested elements that we have inside will then be described in a row. The binding of this data table to a property in a managed bean will need to produce some kind of collection. For example, an array list. That collection will then provide the objects that are to be displayed within the table. Each object will occupy one row and we will identify in the columns the various attributes or properties of those objects that are to be displayed in each column. As well as defining the data that goes into the column, we'll also have opportunity to define the header and the footer for that column. And we'll show you an example in a few moments. So depending on where the, the row is that we're currently displaying, the column will either be rendered as a th element or a td element in the HTML. So here we have the beginning of a data table in the uh, facelet. You can see that the value attribute has been bound to a property in the customer managed bean. Now that property, of course, will be accessed via the get method. So there'll be a method in there called get customer summaries. And as long as it returns a collection, it doesn't really matter how it gets its data. That collection will come back to the facelet that will then proceed to display each object in that collection. And each object will in turn be accessed by this var or variable attribute, and we're giving it our own name. Whatever name we refer to here is going to be made use of in some of the column elements that we nest inside. We can also define some CSS classes, one for the entire table, one for the header, and then one or more for the rows. Now, if we've got more than one row, as we've seen in previous examples, if we've got more than one row class, then they will be used <coughs> alternately. So the first one will be used for the first row, the second one for the second row. The third row will then come back and use the first one and so on in rotation. So we've bound the data table to a collection and we've said that within this table, the individual object for a particular row will be referred to as cust in this example. When we nest column elements within the data table element, we then are able to bind the content of that column to a property in the object in that collection. We can also specify header and footer by making use of these facet elements. So facet name equals header will set up a piece of data that will be displayed in the header row for that column. Now I'm using a literal here called name. It doesn't have to be a literal, it could be some kind of variable. But whatever you use, that will appear at the top of the column in the header row. The other facet is footer, and that will appear at the bottom of the table after all the content columns have been displayed. So we'll have in this example for the one column, we'll have a header called name, an undefined number of rows because we don't know how big the collection is. But if the collection has got eight objects, then there will be eight rows with a name in them. 
and then a tenth row, which will be the footer. And in this example, we're going to have a combination of literal with variable, total colon space, then a value that we're extracting from the managed bean, followed by another space and then the word customers. We can do that for as many columns as we want in the table. So the slightly expanded version of this example illustrates the use of the var cust that is being used down in the column element. There will be, remember, as many rows as there are objects. So the first row will display the first object, the second row the second object. So there's going to be some kind of iteration. We do not write that iteration. That's part of the, the life cycle, the framework. We're just taking advantage of what the framework will do on our behalf. Each time around, cust will have a different value. Each row, cust will be pointing at a different object. And then we can access the properties from that uh, object. And we can see the full example by uh, looking at the code that you can download from Blackboard. It, it'll start off by displaying the summary of all the customers. So this is where the collection of customer objects comes in. And you can see that we've got a button for each row. There can be a command button that will allow us, when we click on it, to view the details of that specific customer. And that means we need some mechanism whereby the command button can extract the specific object and relay that to the other view. Let's take a look and see how this all hangs together in the code. In index XHTML, we have the facelet. It's making use of a template, as we discussed in the previous learning block. Here's the data table linked to the customer summaries that we get from the managed being called customer. We've got three columns, each with a header, and there's a footer for this middle column. Each has got some content, which is bound to a property in the managed bean. And in the third column, we've got a command button. And we want to link that to some kind of method that will extract, ready for the next view, the specific customer that we want to use. Now in this example, we've provided a method in the managed bean called fetch customer details, and we're passing in the ID of the customer for this particular row. So cust.id is used up in that column, and then we're using it down here as well as a parameter on this method call. So in the managed bean, as well as the method get customer summaries, which is going to extract from the database, as you can see here, uh, making use of select customer ID and name from customer. It will extract that data from the database. And as we process the result set, we're going to build a customer DTO object. DTO is shorthand for data transfer object. So I'm extracting the data from the database, putting it into, into an object, which is a data transfer object. It allows me to pass data around my system and then drop that object into an array list. You can see the array list is declared up here, an array list of customer DTO objects initialized as an empty array list. And therefore, each time we go around this loop, we will create a new customer DTO put that into the array list. So if it turns out that there are eight customers in the database that are extracted by this query, then there will be eight objects added into the array list. When it comes to passing that array list to the data table element in the facelet, those eight objects will be displayed in a separate row each, giving us eight rows of content, plus the footer row and the header row. The other method is the action method that's going to fetch customer details, making use of that customer ID. And that's simply going to prepare a statement, select star from customer where customer ID equals, and then a placeholder. Remember, we use prepared statements rather than ordinary statements because it guards against problems such as SQL injection. So we've got one placeholder, therefore we will set that placeholder equal to cust ID, which is the parameter that's been passed in here, and then we can execute the query. That should give us one and only one row. So I'm using an if instead of a while loop in, in checking the result set. And if result set dot next returns true, it means that there was one row. 
it's been loaded, now we can access it. So we'll create another customer DTO object, this time populating all its properties, whereas in the summary we were only populating the ID and the name. Now we're populating all of them because we want the full details for the one object. Close the statement, close the connection, and then return the string that says next view is view customer. And that will cause view customer to be displayed. And in view customer, because I'm now displaying just one object, I'm going to make use of a panel grid. And that will allow me to have the number of columns that I want. And I can predefine the number of rows because I know exactly which properties I'm going to display. And remember in a panel grid with two columns, each pair of output elements will form one row. So I've got a label and then a property from the managed bean. Another row with another label and a property from the managed bean and so on. Now because of that command button, having the command method, each one of these buttons will link to the object with that corresponding ID. Clicking this button will display a different set of details from clicking that button. Let's do a quick review of the life cycle. We've got this view here. We can see the facelet code behind here, which produces this view. And when the submit button is clicked, that of course is going to populate the component tree that represents that view using the values that are in the view. So whatever the user has typed in the text box will end up within that component tree. And it's populated with valid values. We talked a little bit about what valid values means in the previous learning block. We're going to add the final bit of detail today. Knowing that we've got valid values, those can now be transferred into the managed bean. So the managed bean only ever has valid values. We can process those valid values in the appropriate way. There might, for example, be a command method that is invoked from the command button that will trigger some kind of processing of this data. Whatever processing is done, there needs to be a response. So the user knows that something has happened. That response must be rendered. It will come from a view, a facelet. So we will populate a component tree for the new view using values from the user bean and then render the view using those valid values. I mentioned in passing in the previous learning block something about valid values have got to be validated but also converted. We talked last time about validation. Now we're going to talk about the conversion which will completely demystify the magic I've been talking about for the last few learning blocks. This is the last bit of magic. Valid values means two things. First, it is of the correct type. If you're asking for an integer, then it's no good having a string. If you're asking for a boolean, it's no good having a double value. So they have to be of the correct type. Being of the correct type, they must then satisfy the business rules. So if you need the age of a driving license holder, then that age must be greater than or equal to 17. Anything less than that would violate business rules and therefore would not be considered valid. The validators determine validity of data. Converters ensure that we've got the correct data type. And so this idea of populating the component tree with valid values consists of two steps. The first step is applying the necessary conversions to take the string values that come from the HTML form and convert those into the appropriate data type ready for use within the managed bean. And having converted successfully, then go on to do the validation to ensure that the business rules have also been met. Validation will not happen if there are any conversion errors. The entire life cycle will be abandoned if there are any conversion errors. Likewise, if there are any validation errors, as we saw in the previous learning block, the life cycle will also be abandoned. Conversion is done before validation. Just exactly when that happens will depend on whether a property called immediate has been set to true or to false. The default is false. We haven't been using the immediate attribute, therefore by default it has been false. If on the other hand you put in for a an input element immediate equals true, that will cause the conversion and validation to be done 
when applying those values to the component tree. In other words, it's done immediately as we're populating that component tree. On the other hand, if we either omit the immediate attribute or we set it equal to false, the conversion and validation are done as I've been telling you thus far, which is after populating the component tree and before populating the managed beam. Let's think a little bit about what conversion actually means. I've already mentioned that all data that comes from an HTML form comes in the form of a string. It's buried as a parameter on the query string and the query string in HTML is a string, a great long string with the URL of the resource that's been requested, question mark, and then a set of parameters which are name equals value pairs. They're all strings and so if we want to have them as integers or doubles or whatever else, then they have to be converted. So there are two operations when converting. The first operation is to take the string that has arrived from the HTML form and convert it to the appropriate data type. The next operation for conversion is in the other direction. When we want to render a value, it might be an integer, it might be a customer, it might be whatever. When we want to render that value back into a view, well, that view is HTML and therefore it has to be a string. So we need to convert the value back into a string. So two operations, from string to object and from object back to string. There's an implicit conversion and explicit conversion. Implicit will happen when standard converters are used. For example, if you have a property in your managed bean that is of type int, that's a primitive data type, the system can very easily work out what kind of data type should be used for this particular string that's come in. There's a well-defined mechanism in standard Java for converting a string to an int. Integer.parsInt. So primitive data types will be converted to their wrapper class objects. Int values will become integers. Double, lowercase d, will be converted into double objects, uppercase d. Now that's great for the standard conversion of primitive data types, but then we've got other objects. We might, for example, have a, a date time object and we'll want to be able to convert that. So there are some explicit conversions that come as standard with JSF. We can write our own custom converter classes as well. Let's take a look at some of the implicit conversion first. Type discovery. This is done as part of the life cycle that the control servlet goes through. It will take a look at the property that is bound to this input element in the facelet code, examine that property to determine its data type, and then employ the appropriate converter to take the string to that data type. Here we have an input text that is bound to user.age. The type of user.age will be discovered by an examination, a very quick examination of the managed bean, and then the implicit converter will convert it from the string into an int or integer value depending on the setting. And there's an example of that in the converter example proj that you can download from Blackboard. Here's another uh, example of conversion, this time explicit conversion. This is where we're using a date and a time. What we want to do is to convert a string into a date object. There is in java.txt package a class called simple date format. It has got a method called parse that will take a string and convert it wherever possible to a date and will take a date and convert it to a string in the format method. So those two methods, parse and format, are essentially what are being used here with the convert date time element. You can see how we're using that converter. We have the input text element and nested within that element, so between the start and the end tags, we've got an f convert date time. And what we're using is this attribute here, pattern, that will define the format in which the string should be converted to uh, a date. Please watch out. Lowercase mm is actually minutes, not month. So this is saying that the user is re required to enter a string that represents a date in the format two digits for day, then a slash, two digits for month, then a slash, 
four digits for the year. Assuming the user actually uses that format, then the conversion will happen quite simply and a date object will be created and used within the classes that sit behind the facelet. We can use a similar conversion for when we want to output. Another bit of explicit conversion, converting a number. Here we are exposing the methods of java.text.decimal format. So that allows us to take a double value, for example, and convert it into a string, if we're doing some output, with a fixed number of decimal places. Or we can take a string and convert that to a double value. You can see the converter here. Again, it's nested within the output text in this example. We can equally well do it for input text. And the convert number converter has a couple of attributes. And we can define the minimum and the maximum number of decimal places. And then we can start making use of custom converters. These are converters that we write. And there are two ways of referring to that. The first is to use this nested converter element where we specify the converter ID, making use of the converter name. And as we saw with validators, so we can do with converters, we can have an attribute on the output text or indeed the input text element, an attribute called converter equal to, and then we use the converter name. Because this is a custom converter, it means we then have to write the code for that converter. We'll provide a class that will have an annotation at faces converter, value equals, and then some kind of name. Now I've used the default name here. In fact, if I wanted to use the default name, I could omit the value equals and then a name altogether and just have the at faces converter new line. And that will still give me the default value for the, the converter name. Because this class, public class discount converter, has been declared by this annotation to be a, a converter, it means that we have to implement the converter interface. And that converter interface has these two methods. Get as object, where it takes a value of type string and will convert it to the appropriate object, an integer or a double or a calendar object or a customer object or whatever. And going in the other direction, get as string will take this object and convert it to a string. Get as string is going to be used on output get as object is going to be used for input. As with validation, so with conversion. If you don't provide a useful, helpful method for the user to see when there's an error, there's going to be a very verbose and probably very unhelpful message that goes out from the standard environment. So it's always a very good idea when you're doing conversion to provide your own converter message for those elements. Let's take a look at some examples within the code that you can download from Blackboard. So in view customer, we can see an example of a convert number. Here we're making use of the custom converter for taking a discount and converting it to an object from a string and back to an object from a string. Let's go and take a look at that class. This is in the source packages. I've set up a separate package called converter because you might very well have many converters that you write for your application. So it's probably well to put them into a separate package. Discount converter has the two methods, get as object, get as string. You have to know something about how that string is going to be formatted. Now in this example, I know that there's going to be some kind of separator between the various values of the discount. And so I'm going to take the string that comes as the parameter new value and I'm going to split based upon this regular expression. Now the split method for a string will use the regular expression. Any match with that regular expression will delimit some part of the string. That string will then be put into an, a, a string array as an element in the array. And then another search for another delimiter another delimiter found will mean there's another bit of string that is going to be put into the string array in a separate element. So by the time split has finished, the original string will have been chopped up using those delimiters into individual substrings and those substrings put into a string array. We can then make use of that string array 
as we're doing here, to set up, in this case, a new discount DTO object. The first part of the string will be used in this, as this parameter. The second part of the string will be used as that parameter. If we take a look at that class, you can see that we have a string for the code and a double value for the rate. <coughs> and that's why we're taking the string from the array and using double.parse double to convert it from string to a double value. By the time we've finished executing this statement, the discount DTO object has been created. It's got a code, it's got a rate, both of the correct type, encapsulated in a discount DTO object, which then can be returned. On the other hand, there could be a problem with the conversion. In this example, it might be that part one holds a string that does not convert to a double value. That will give rise to a number format exception, which we're catching and then throwing a new converter exception. That converter exception being thrown will then be caught by the control servlet. It will go into its error recovery mode, which is redisplay the original view along with an error message. Well, the error message might well be this converter exception message, unless you've provided a converter message in the facelet, in which case that facelet's converter message will be used instead of the one that comes from here. Get our string goes in the other direction. We are given something of type object. Now it should be a discount DTO object. Before we can make use of it as a discount DTO object, we'll have to do a bit of type conversion. So there's that first bit of validation in terms of conversion. Let's see that we've got something of the correct type. So we're checking value instance of discount DTO. If it isn't, that tells us we've got a problem. We're trying to convert something that is not a discount DTO object. Therefore, throw new converter exception with a message. If this condition fails, that means we're okay. We've got a discount DTO object, so we can typecast value into a discount DTO object, and we're storing it as D, and then we can start to format the string. So here I'm using string.format. You're familiar with this from system.out.printf. So we have a format string. There's a placeholder for a string, a placeholder for a decimal value, placeholder for a string, and then the <coughs> one, two, three values to use in place of those one, two, three placeholders. That string is then returned, which is what this method is all about. And now we've converted the discount DTO object into a string using a format, which is the code, space, open bracket, rate, close bracket. Let's give you a little bit more sophistication now for your facelets. Guiding user choice is a useful thing to do because it reduces the amount of validation that you have to do, reduces the amount of errors that the user can send your way. So if you provide, for example, a list box with all the valid values in, you know that you're going to get a valid value. If you provide a checkbox or a set of checkboxes or radio buttons and so on, that will be another way of giving the user opportunity to select one of valid values. On the other hand, you might want them to select many. When you've got list boxes, menus, check boxes, you can have the user select multiple values. And this is how you'd set it up in the facelet. This example is for a select one list box. In other words, a list box that only allows the user to pick one option from the list. What we talk about for this particular construct is replicatable for all the others. So if you understand how this one works, then you understand how all the others can work. We don't actually provide the code for the list box. That's done for us by the facelet environment. We just say, I want to make use of the select one list box element from the facelet library. We specify in value the property of the managed bean that the selection will be bound to. So the item that is selected by the user will be bound to that property in customer. But the user has to have something to pick from. And so the second element here is the select items element, which is linked to a property that will provide a collection. That collection is of type, in fact, it's an array of select item objects. So select item is going to wrap whatever object we want to use. It might be a string object. It might be a customer object. Or in this example, it might be 
uh, an array of discount DTO objects. And so the select item object will wrap the discount DTO object. And that's all we have to do, those two bindings. And then the control servlet, when it hits this particular element, will say, right, oh, I need to set up in the HTML that I'm rendering a list box, and I'm going to bind it to that property so that whenever the user picks one, it ends up in that property in the managed bean. And I'm going to provide a list of options that comes out of this array of select item objects. Let's take a look and see how that's done. In this example, the one file is displaying the same information in two different ways. So we've got up here the panel grid with code and discount rate. We've also got exactly the same information in a select one list box set up in the way that we've just seen on screen. Therefore, we want to make sure it's getting the right values for its options. So if we take a look at the rate list, that is linked to the get rate list method that is going to return an array of select item objects. This will get from an array list called rates, the size so that we know how big to make the array, and then we'll iterate through the array list and for each object in that array list, we'll create a discount DTO rate, wrap that up inside a select item object, and then put that select item object into the items array, which eventually gets returned. That's all that the method has to do. So that array of select item objects goes back to the facelet. The control servlet will decode that and display it. But it's going to display it as a set of strings. So where do those strings come from? Let's go and take a look at discount DTO and we'll see that there is a two string method. But when that object is to be rendered, the two string method is going to be called in this example. So there's the format of the string that's going to be output. Later on, we're going to have to convert it. Uh, there's a piece of code in here that is absolutely crucial for conversion that I'll mention in a few moments. When the user picks one of those items in the list, that is then bound to a property in customer. If we take a look at that, it's going to set the discount property, which takes as a parameter a discount DTO object. But all we've got is something of type string. So that needs to be converted back from the string to a discount DTO object. And that's where the converter is used. However, and this is the thing that will catch you out and will make you scratch your head because you'll get a message that says, these aren't equal. And the reason you'll get that message is because you'll have forgotten to write the equals method. When you do a, a comparison between two objects, you can either compare their references or you can compare their content. If you just say, I'm going to ask, is reference one equal equal reference two? You're comparing the memory addresses, the pointers. In other words, you're asking, are these two references pointing at the same object? Now, in what we're doing here, that will not be the case because one object will have been created to display the list. And then when you select, you're getting a string and creating a different object. So you've now got two objects with the same content. But if you don't provide an overriding method called equals, then all you'll end up doing is using the default override, which is the original equals method in the, in the object class. And that would say these two objects that have got the same content are not equal because they haven't got the same reference and I don't know how to decode their content. This means that in the discount DTO class, we must provide an equals method that will allow two different objects to be compared to see if their content is the same. And if their content is the same, return true. In all other cases, return false. That equals method will then be used in that conversion process to make sure that you're getting equality with selections. A companion of equals is the hash code method. So whenever you override equals, you should also override hash code Hash code simply returns an integer that is some kind of representation of that object. Here is an example of doing it. By the time you finish this learning block, you'll have done quite a bit. You'll have made use of data tables and converters. You'll have even written your own standard converter. And you will have made use of some ways of guiding user choice. So quite an exciting learning block, this one. Lots of different things going on. 
drawing on stuff you've seen in previous learning blocks and adding some new things to it.